Hello everyone. Welcome to Earth. Hello everyone. Welcome to Earth.org Talks. Uh, today we are speaking with Mark Linus, uh, covering his new book, uh, Our Final Warning: Six Degrees of Climate Emergency. Uh, we are Earth.org, a not-for-profit environmental organization based in Hong Kong. Our aim is to bring attention to what is happening to natural ecosystems worldwide. We advocate for sustainable economic policies for the protection of the natural environment and an extension of governments or oversight to cover the global commons. With Earth Thorough Talks, we are engaging with inspiring change makers and thought leaders to share their opinion and knowledge with our global audience, all to bring attention to what we humans are doing to our planet. Now, I would like to welcome author, journalist, and environmentalist, Mark Linus. Uh, Mark has written for numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, The Guardian, and CNN mostly covering climate change, the Anthropocene, and environmentalism. He is the author of numerous books, including High Tide, Six Degrees, which won the Royal Society Science Books Prize in 2007, The God Species, Nuco 2.0, and Seeds of Science. And his most recent book, Our Final Warning, Six Degrees of Climate Emergency, was published in June 2020, and it is a timely update on the original Six Degrees. Our Final Warning categorizes the escalating consequences of climate emergency for each degree of warming we surpass and how we can still avoid these disastrous outcomes. So welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining us today. Um, thanks, Tristan. Nice to be here. Great. So just to start, uh, you know, like we just said, our final warning is an update on the original six degrees from 2007. Uh, was there a specific moment in the past few years that made you decide it was time to update six degrees and to kind of to to give it another to give it another look. Um, there wasn't a moment that I recall so much as this constant drumbeat of inquiries via email or, or anything else, social media, people asking really whether having written six degrees back in 2007, whether I was more or less pessimistic or optimistic given that the time that's elapsed since then. Obviously global emissions have continued to rise uninterruptedly pretty much since that time with no sign of a slowdown at all, even to, right, to, to the time we're speaking right now. Um, but the, the science may have changed. And so, you know, there's, there's new modeling studies, new paleoclimate research, you know, new observational work coming out all the time, which may or may not shed a light on, you know, how things, how bad things are or how bad things are going to get. So, it was really to answer that question. I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't feel I could give a kind of flippant answer of, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling great, or no, it's really depressing, um, without having some kind of basis for that, you know, which meant essentially going back and repeating the, the effort of, of, of surveying and summarizing the scientific literature. And because, I mean, basically, basically, this effort's a bit like doing an IPCC report by yourself. That, I mean, it can't be as rigorous and as comprehensive as that, obviously, because, because of the process and I'm just one person, I'm not even a trained scientist, but, you know, the set, essentially, it's, it, the aim is the same, to give, a, 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 you know, a popular insight and, and honest and hopefully um, accurate insight into the state of the climate change scientific literature and communicate that to a, to a broader audience using this, this narrative structure of, you know, one degree, two degree, three degrees, all up to six degrees. And by the way, that hasn't changed. I mean, so the, you know, the, the six degree, five to six degrees was still in the latest um, IPCC report, well, at least, at least the uh, sixth assessment report of the IPCC, um, not necessarily as a realistic prospect, but as, an, as a consequence of constantly rising emissions. So if we if we did continue to to burn more coal and more oil and more gas throughout the 21st century, that's what you know that that's the worst case scenario that we'd be looking towards is, is still approaching six degrees. So that's why the original title is still relevant because that's still in the ballpark, if you like. Mm -hmm, of course, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the book that uh, when you wrote six degrees, the original six degrees, you were much more optimistic. Than, than you were when you were writing our final warning. Um, is that is that because of is that more because of the way that the science has progressed and what the science is telling us, or because of what you're seeing in in public opinion or in politics? Uh, wh where did that feeling emerge from? It was probably 
because of Trump, to be honest. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, Trump, Trump has illustrated a lot of things kind of about the potential for mass human stupidity. Uh, you know, so I'm always, I'm kind of an empiricist and enlightenment sort of person. I believe in the potential for science to, you know, inform decision-making and for us to sort of pursue rational collective outcomes as a society. And then you get Trump and it's like, okay, actually the stupid stuff about human psychology, our preponderance to, you know, tribal group thinking, you know, mass delusions and conspiracism and, you know, um, sort of hostility and all of the kind of dark side of human nature essentially is captured in the, the Donald Trump phenomenon. And of course that that's coupled with, you know, over climate, <clears throat> climate denialism and, you know, pushing for a resurgence of coal and, you know, the, the, all the scientists are wrong and all that kind of stuff. And, I, you know, then you had Bolsonaro in Brazil and, you know, the rise of populism and the far right globally, which was happening around the time I was writing the book, was, you know, that seemed to presage a different future where, where humanity could actually quite realistically uh, and with a reasonable, reasonably high likelihood take the wrong course and continue to pretend that climate change isn't even a thing. <laughs> you know, as the temperatures spiraled upwards. I mean, there's such a gulf between the, the, the reality and the, and the, and the politics in, in, in the US Republican Party. And maybe that, you know, so given that that level of, as I say, collective stupidity is possible in the most powerful nation on earth, you know, what happens if then the same thing repeats in, in, in India and in China and in Brazil and in all of the other powerful high emitting countries. So I think that's that was a big wake up call. So I don't think there was, the science is that different. I mean, arguably the science has been established since the late 19th century. There isn't, you know, there's lots of details and crossings of T's and dottings of I's and new modeling surveys. And, you know, it's the science of attribution and finding out how much of a given extreme weather event is likely human induced and so on. So there's lots of interesting stuff and I wanted to report on that, but the, the extent to which I felt pessimism was really a reflection of the international political situation more than anything else. Mm -hmm. well, have you, what have you thought about uh, the way public opinion has progressed in the past uh, 10, 15 years? Uh, is it been more, do you, do you feel that people are more engaged with this issue now than they were when you wrote the first book? People are definitely more engaged with the climate change issue. I mean, it's a huge story. Just look at COP26. I mean, that was like the biggest global news story of the you know, second half of the year, probably, um, you know, after COVID, which everyone's now bored of. So um, it, it's not that people aren't aware of the issue or engaged in it. It's more, well, what happens next? You know, how do we actually turn the ship around? And, and is such a thing realistic or, or feasible or even possible technologically and politically? And th those are the big unanswered questions. And I think we're all still kind of floundering about the, the direction of travel. Um, a, a lot of people, I, mean, I don't think, I think, so I don't think public opinion is there with Greta Thunberg and the kind of green campaigners who say we must take on some kind of sacrifice. We must stop flying. We must travel less we must consume less that kind of stuff I, I think if that was something that was mandated by governments there would be a very rapid and large-scale backlash so i think mm -hmm. the extent to which we can go zero carbon it's going to have to be something which is perceived as being a improvement in people's lives and livelihoods um, and you know, because it would have to actually really be that thing. I don't just mean in terms of the communications here. Um, it would have to be felt and understood as being a, a step forward rather than a step back. And that's something I think the Greens have often got wrong and not because you know the, the Greens are quite happy to, to to have less consumption and people use less energy and we all kind of do less. Essentially, that's the that's the kind of the narrative. And actually, most people want to do more. They want to have more. They want to travel more. They want to do more things. They want to have more money. Um, 
so a narrative of less is never going to work. And so, you know, partly I've been trying to think through really what, what, a, what a, a more enticing political message would be to a wider audience um, of, of how we can actually solve this problem and, and build a better world than doing so, which is, is appealing to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> of course. Um, I mean, just um, when we I were talking about how public opinion isn't really aligned with the, the Greta's of the world and, you know, the a lot of the policies and maybe some of these green movements stand for. What do you think is the uh, the best way to communicate in terms of language what what we're dealing with and where we're going? Because obviously kind of you take a bit more of a almost an uninhabitable earth uh, kind of that that tone. Um, kind of talking about the urgency of the situation. Uh, others have taken a different track. Uh, what do you think is the best language to kind of get people a bit more involved and 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 really maybe even a bit more forward thinking about this? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I, I use languages which I feel is scientifically justified. So I think mm -hmm. we can call it a climate emergency. I think we can call it a crisis um, because of the you know the, the urgency of the situation what i'm less comfortable with actually is the kind of overt displays of emotionality people crying on tv and stuff um, that may just be because i'm a sort of uptight english guy um but i don't know whether how effective that is as a kind of communication strategy or, or, or what but it certainly makes me feel awkward but then i think people who who engage in those kinds of protests would say, well, good, I'm glad you're feeling awkward. You should feel awkward. We know we're, we're in an emergency here and you shouldn't feel comfortable about it. So maybe that's something that, um, you know, that I need to work on, but it certainly, yeah, it doesn't, to, I mean, to me, we need to kind of get away from business as usual. It's not, you know, this isn't just another normal um, challenge that we can, we can deal with, you know, without really thinking about it. It, it, it does require a step change in, well, the whole way that human civilization is is powered essentially and um, which is going to mean some some pretty big shifts but we've had some pretty big shifts already in the last you know few years i mean the communications revolution i mean i'm old enough to remember before computers believe it or not i was talking with my cousin about this uh, a few days ago because he came to visit and we're both like he's 50 i'm 48 um and we remember the first computers the first mic you know micro computers um, there was a there was one that had 1k I used to have a BBC micro that had 32k and you could write half an essay on it we run out of memory um, and you know it's been such a transformational shift in our lives to be where we are now talking on a zoom call with smartphones and what's happened all of this um, that it, it would have been inconceivable to our younger selves to have this level of, of global communication we, we, when, when we communicated internationally we used to write airmail paper, which was like thin tissue paper, and you had to write and send it in a thin tissue paper type um, letter that said buy airmail on it. And that was the only way we could communicate. It was too expensive to do a phone call, even internationally. So what a different world we're living in. And you know, how long has that taken? Uh, 35 years, right. maybe more. Um, within that time scale, we can be zero carbon and we can transform you know, modern human civilization to energy sources which aren't dependent on fossil fuels I'm, I'm convinced of that and, and it will be a huge shift but it's, it may not be that much more epochal than the shift we've already experienced sure definitely uh just uh touching you know a bit more on the the context of of your book so it came out in the midst of in the midst of covid uh and do you do you think looking at the way that the world is moving forward now are you optimistic that COVID may have taught us or at least had a better listen to the science in the within the context of environmentalism and climate change moving forward? I'm not sure that COVID's taught us anything, which is particularly relevant to climate. I mean, we saw, I mean, so yeah, it was unfortunate for me. The book came out like within a week of the first lockdown in the UK anyway. Um, so people's minds were elsewhere. <laughs> But you hope with the book it has, you know, to kind of phrase a longer shelf life. That's sort of the idea, um, and it should should remain yet relevant for a few years. I mean, it was the the original two thousand seven six degrees. And I know I digress here, but that was still being read. I mean, people were still buying it and re referencing it. 
I mean, more than well, nearly 15 years after it had been written. And it was partly for because I sort of felt that was, um, well, I felt it needed an update because people were still using the damn thing. Um, but anyway, you know, back to COVID. So we saw emissions fall by what was it, five, six, seven percent, and for, for one year, in response to an absolutely colossal lockdown, which hugely restricted people's freedom of movement, freedom of travel, um, freedom generally to to you know engage in all the things that we we do and so it, it kind of illustrated for me that that's not a plausible approach you know if we if we were to cut emissions by seven percent every single year we'd be doing pretty well in terms of temperature outcomes but you you can't expect a 50-year rolling lockdown <laughs> to tackle the climate that's that's my objection to the kind of the green prescription the pe people it's not it's just not going to happen i even think you know, I remember the, the days of the ozone layer. I think if we'd had to give up refrigeration or even hairspray, we'd have no ozone layer today. So maybe I'm a bit of a pessimist about human capacity for shouldering collective sacrifice. Um, perhaps with the one exception of wars. You know, everyone loves a good war, and we all we all happily take sacrifices together. But we're sort of hardwired for that. But things which are less obvious and are less, you know clearly a sort of national emergency. I don't think people are prepared to take sacrifices for him. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I mean, COVID has been a huge triumph for science in terms of the vaccine, the rapid development of vaccines, but it's uh, and just the, you know, millions of lives that have already been saved by that. And the, the ability to, you know, to remove some of the more coercive measures and to go back to something more approaching normal life, thanks to, the incredible progress of science and genetic science, mRNA vaccines, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so maybe that's a lesson for us of what the, you know what what science can accomplish. But then you also see the backlash, and you see the anti-science movement. You see the the anti-vaxxers who, you know, I used to think I've, I've campaigned against anti-vaccination movements for a long time, and I used to think that well, one thing that would make anti-vaxxers go away would be a pandemic because then it would be bleeding obvious to everyone that we needed vaccines. You know, it's not the same with measles or, um, you, know, the, you know, some of the things which people have, you know, regular childhood vaccines for because the disease, diseases are so rare, they're not that obvious anymore. But yeah, so how wrong I was about that. So the, the human capacity for letting politics and psychology get in the way of um, smart decision-making I think was also become very evident in the COVID pandemic. Right. Yeah. And I mean, even even now with the, you know, we're, we're just seeing the past few years, you know, this big, uh, these big, very steep drops in, 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 in pricing for renewables and things like that. And just all these great innovations that are coming online. And it's just, uh, it's a lot harder almost for, for, for governments to, you know, we have the science, it's just harder for, to see the governments actually making the moves to 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 implement them and to update the infrastructure and make it a bit more make it easier for people to adopt all these all these new things that are that uh, that, that we have at our disposal uh, solutions wise um going going a bit more into you know the solutions and kind of you know these pathways forward i i want to ask quick about because you also wrote a book that defended uh nuclear power's role uh as an approach to uh mitigating climate change um do you still uh well first like what's your what's your stance on it if you could quickly summarize it and do you still believe that it, it nuclear does need to be a part of our approach yeah I, I think i mean i haven't changed on my view on that the thing is i mean you mentioned about the falling prices of renewables and and solar in particular and that that's all true but it still hasn't solved the night problem or the winter problem or just the intermittency problem generally and we've seen this in in europe so there's been a lot of for a lot of there's a kind of a lot of the whole group of sort of 100 renewables advocates who insist that we can get grid balancing and the storage options are out there and we just have to scale it up but, but it's really not true you you can't run a large-scale grid of a proper country with 100 renewables you, you just can't be done and you it, that's a recipe for blackouts and backlash and collapse essentially and so that problem has not been solved um there's no such thing as grid scale storage at the country level which can operate for more than a few hours really and that that's asking a lot 
certainly not for days and weeks and months, which you need to balance weather fluctuations. We had low wind in Europe this um, this summer, and they were switching the coal-fired power stations back on, and huge amounts of gas. You know, the the Greens are trying to shut down nuclear in um, in in Belgium and Germany, obviously, and uh, other countries, and they make plans now for more gas fired power stations because they know ultimately they've got to keep the lights on so you've got this peculiar spectacle of green parties who insist there's a climate emergency trying to build more fossil fuels in order to get rid of nuclear which is the thing they've cared about passionately since the 1970s but actually has no scientific basis and so that kind of stuff really pisses me off and i've spent years and years campaigning and advocating and arguing about this and I do think the public in general has become more friendly to nuclear um, as it's become seen that actually it's it, it's essential. We won't be able to, to, to undertake a zero carbon transition without a lot of nuclear fission because it's the only, well, it's the only large scale viable baseload power source we have which doesn't emit, emit carbon. Um, and it's also extremely environmentally friendly. I mean, people talk about waste, but it's a trivial issue that can be, you know, you can store waste canisters in a in a basketball court for a few centuries. I mean, it, nobody gets harmed. It's not an environmental problem. It's a kind of psychology problem that people have through having been exposed to anti-nuclear propaganda for <laughs> many decades. And so it's it's there for me. I'm a pro-science campaigner. I'm campaigning for evidence and, you know, uh, sort of informed policymaking. And so for me, nuclear and GMOs is another one and climate, they all fit and vaccines all fit into the same box where you've got people have for, for one ideological persuasion or another refused to accept scientific evidence and yeah that's that's what one of the things that i'm passionate about and which gets me up in the morning is trying to convince people who should know better and whose motivations are i think probably very honorable to take the science seriously and actually look at the evidence on, on all of these things mm -hmm. sure uh what about you know more kind of still exciting and emerging technologies but that are not maybe not uh, maybe haven't been proved yet you know so things like geoengineering or carbon capture and things like that which may, might be a bit more um polarizing for for a lot of people uh, are you optimistic about these emerging technologies no not particularly because i think the physics is against carbon capture um you know you'd have to if you're going to carry on burning fossil fuels and put it underground or even do air capture and put it underground, you'd have to be like reversing the, the, the oil and gas industry for several decades and capturing literally billions of tons through thousands, tens of thousands of enormous pipelines and somehow sequestering this into geological formations. I mean, it's just not going to happen. And it's not even particularly, it's not even necessary. I mean, actually, nuclear fission can do all of that stuff as can very large scale renewables developments and i mean large scale like tens of thousands of square kilometers of solar in hot deserts that kind of stuff i mean this you can't do this in small scale we, we're burning 100 million barrels of oil a day you can't replace that with a few a few rooftop solar panels so we need to be honest about the physics and honest about the scale of the challenge and remember we don't have we don't have zero carbon aviation there's just no technological option for that we don't have zero carbon steel we don't have zero carbon cement we don't have zero carbon shipping. We don't even have zero carbon surface transport. I mean, you've got electric cars, but it's still, and I, I drive one myself, but it's an early stage. The charging infrastructure isn't there. The grid isn't zero carbon yet. So we haven't solved that problem, which is meant to be the easiest one. Um, let alone agriculture, people are still eating a lot of meat. There's methane coming out of all of these ruminant cattle and, what, and sheep and whatnot. Um, but deforestation is still a huge issue. So in every single sector, we've made some progress, but we're a long way from even having a picture of what the, 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 the end goal might be or how we might even get there. <clears throat> so that, I mean, and to, to innovators, that must be, you know, that must be fantastic. They must be delighted. You've got new Teslas all waiting or Elon Musk's all waiting around the corner to become the next big tech billionaire and, and through solving these problems. Uh, uh, you know, that's the power of capitalism, I guess. Um, but it's not there yet. And you know, so I think we need to be just honest with ourselves about how much, how far we've still got to go. Do you think that, you know, technology innovation, these, these very exciting, you know, new, new developments that, yeah, they, they do get a lot of people excited. They do get a lot of people 
invested in a, in a certain cause, um, especially with these new ones coming online. But do you think it can be, you know, maybe even a bit of a distraction for, you know, the might maybe a little bit more boring things like a behavioral change, more kind of systemic change in economies and, and things like that? No, because I think technology is pretty much the only thing that's going to happen. And remember, technology drives behavioral change, not the reverse. Like we're not, we, we didn't decide to talk internationally with a picture. We waited for Zoom to invent this and then we were on a Zoom call. So it wasn't our behavioral change of us having this conversation as a result of the technology being available. And I think the same will happen in, 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 the, in, in the climate change space as well. Um, so asking people to stay at home and not do things is just, is not viable, particularly, it's not viable anywhere, but it's particularly not viable in, in developing countries who are still you know, at the poverty line and who want to see rapid and sustained economic growth. Um, that's gonna require huge increases in energy, particularly electricity, and that's got to come from somewhere. So, you, you know, you, you hear a lot of this kind of discourse of, of, of sacrifice and lifestyle change and whatnot from greenie type people in the global north. But it's really, you know, I don't ever hear that stuff when I'm working in Bangladesh or in sub-Saharan Africa or anything. People, people are not interested in, <laughs> in, you know, in staying poor or, you know, consuming less or anything like that. And so you, you've just got to, I, I guess I'm a pragmatist. You've just got to think, okay, right. You know, and I work with some, with some of the governments in these, these countries in Bangladesh and Maldives and other places. And, and so we've, we, we, we pursue this idea called climate prosperity. So we actually link together this sort of innovation and growth agenda with climate mitigation. So Bangladesh has just carried out a climate prosperity plan. So they want to be a middle income country by 2040 something. Okay, what's that going to need in terms of energy? How's that going to be produced? And how are we going to do that while um, also putting Bangladesh on the track for net zero like the rest of the world has to be? And, and how can they be, you know, how can they emerge as winners in that and, and technological leaders and innovators and, you know, um, job creators and all of the rest of it from that scenario. So that that's, I think, a winning formula is, is seeing the climate issue as a springboard pro to prosperity for, for the developing countries in the South, not as some kind of sacrifice where you've got to ask them to not develop and not become not become prosperous nations. Yeah, this is, um, I mean, the, the relationship between, you know, climate change and environmental policy and, and jobs, especially, you know, like emerging job markets, uh, emerging sectors, emerging industries. It's, it's something that, you know, we were talking about developing countries, but even in, even in the US, you know, uh, Biden has, has pushed that angle quite, quite, uh, quite hard that, uh, climate change. When he hears climate change, he means he means jobs. Um, he hears jobs. He he thinks that there's a there's a big uh, economic motive to be had from from tackling this issue. Um, do you think do you think that's a good way to approach it politically for leaders like Biden? Oh, that's clearly very smart politics, and it's the only thing that's going to move the issue. I mean, if you were to say to people you know, well, we're going to close down the coal mines, we're going to shutter the oil refineries, we're going to stop producing cars, and there's no jobs. There's no way you stay in power as a politician. So it would be goodbye Biden, hello Trump, and it would be like, yeah, more jobs for coal miners, you know. So it's the, it's the only political option. Um, and I think it's, it's smart, and it's probably true as well. Um, if you're If you want to see more jobs and high paying jobs, I mean, this is one of the things I've really noticed is that you get all these Republican senators who deny climate change, but they're very happy when a big Tesla gigafactory comes into their state, making you know the, the next generation of, of large scale car batteries for the zero carbon transition. They're delighted. Same when there's a new you know next generation nuclear power station that's um, that's being brought in. And one of the options now is repowering coal using nuclear fission where you can basically just turn off the coal boilers and use all the same steam generation and you know, transmission infrastructure that generated from zero carbon. And that way you get to keep the high paying jobs, you get to you know, keep the place alive um, rather than just shutting stuff down. So you know, the, yeah, I think that's, that's very smart politics and it's the only thing really which is gonna, gonna win people's hearts and minds because you know, we're not all intellectuals who fly from cop to cop and <laughs> like I do. 
you know, that this is our job. Um, most people out there still have normal jobs and normal lives. And it's got to be then that you think about, certainly as a politician, because those are the people who vote you in or vote you out. Right. Uh, definitely. We, we definitely agree with that. We definitely agree. It's a, it's a good angle to take and a good, something that can get people even excited about, about moving forward on this issue. Uh, so, you know, you just mentioned COP and uh, I mean, I, I assume you attended. Uh, what were your feelings about, about its outcomes? Yeah, I was at COP26 um, working with the developing country coalition called the Climate Vulnerable Forum. Um, and specifically with um, former President Nasheed from the Maldives, who have worked as climate advisor for on and off since 2009. When he was president from 2009 to 2012, he's now Speaker of Parliament, having had a period in jail again um, between those two things. And um, yeah, so, you know, it, it, it was good actually how, how prominent his voice was and how the voice of other vulnerable developing country leaders were really prominent in the COP. I think they're getting a lot more attention now. Um, how far they get to actually influence the outcome? I mean, you saw this in the the final plenary where the coal language was was um, was was reduced by the intervention of um, one or two you know big powerful countries. The, the the small island states and the vulnerable countries were really upset about that, but they were faced with a kind of a, a, a dilemma of if they were to to refuse to accept that change then the whole process would fall apart and all of the 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 improvements that they'd fought for for the previous two weeks and you know all the humdrum areas like loss and damage and adaptation and financing and you know in, improving ndc reporting and all of this kind of stuff would also have just gone so that i mean that's the nature of politics i guess uh, the that's an, so it was i don't know it's it's kind of a glass half full glass half empty thing it's good to see language referring, referencing fossil fuels and coal in particular in the final outcome. But at the same time, you all go home and you, you know, look out the window and you think, God, actually, everything's just carrying on as normal. <laughs> you know, there's no sign in a no sign of a climate mitigation related downturn in emissions or, or of concentrations in the atmosphere or anything like that. And after all, that's what's really that's what's driving climate warming. And that's what ultimately we will only solve the problem by solving that. Do you think at this stage, you know, COP is very, is very, you know, it's built on multilateral agreements, uh, built on compromises. It's built on, like you said, like, you know, developing nations going along with the, the, the requests of, of these wealthier countries, because otherwise then nothing will come out of it. Uh, do, do you think that there's a case to be made for perhaps more unilateral processes, you know, like the EU carbon border tax or, you know, initiatives like that? Do you think that those can play a role as well? I mean, it's easy to be cynical about the COP because it's just such a jamboree. Um, but at the same time, would it be better for the multilateral process not to exist? I, I actually, I really don't think so. I mean, it does focus minds. It gives a deadline. It gives a clear sense of political momentum to this issue every year and you know it, it does up the collective level of ambition and you mentioned unilateralism instead but basically the Paris system is a, a, a whole bunch of unilateral commitments that's what the pledges are it's not a top-down treaty like Kyoto was or the Montreal protocol was on the ozone there where you had a sort of collective out, uh, ambition and therefore and then the countries had to divide it up it's the other way around it's bottom up so all of the countries put unilateral voluntary pledges on the table and it's supposed to add up to the achievement of the Paris goals of, well, of uh, hopefully 1.5 degrees. And of course, there's always this gap between what the countries put on the table and, and the 1.5 degree target. Um, but the pledges that have been made under the Paris system are a lot better than, you know, what was on the, on the cards for business as usual. You know, when I was, when I was writing the first, six degrees we were looking seriously at a most likely outcome of above four degrees with all the paris pledges and all the ndcs and stuff it came down to what is it i don't know 2.4 and if you're if you're optimistic about it and you think governments can deliver and all of the different pledges on 
methane and deforestation and India putting in 500 gigawatts of clean energy. And if all of that happens, then we're supposedly closer to 1.8 or so. That's not, you know, a mile away from 1.5. So, so I think there's, you can be positive about this too and say, right, we've got the ambition. Um, the, the pledges now are, are getting better and better and we can carry on ratcheting up this ambition every single year, hopefully. But we also need to deliver, and that you know we we need to see really measurable and <laughs> verifiable, to use the terminology of the COP process, uh, reductions in emissions as a result of these policies. Um, and I think that's not clear yet. And I think we'll we'll, we'll really I'll believe that we're solving the problem when I see that. And you see, actually, we're now well on the way to net zero, and we've seen some of these very large scale technological economic shifts which need to happen right definitely it, it, it is definitely encouraging that you know in the past 10 years we've gone from i think it was yeah four to four to six degrees predicted or trajectory and now like you said the 1.8 to 2.7 but yeah of course a lot more needs to be done and we, we definitely want to see um action match ambition in the next in the next few years for sure uh do you think so kind of moving on a bit more into you know the the politics of it uh do you think that we really need you know these big countries like us and china uh do they need to cooperate uh more on climate policy climate diplomacy do you see kind of that being an integral part of uh of us of our actions moving forward yeah so there was a bilateral agreement between the us and china in the latter stages of the cop and that was one of the things that I think helped to restore some optimism and some momentum to the process. Um, and if you remember, previous to Paris, there was an, also another agreement with um, Xi Jinping and uh, President Obama, as it was at the time, which really set the stage, I think, for a successful outcome there um, in, uh, what was it, 2015. So it's, it's absolutely essential, particularly given the geopolitical competition that's now kind of going on this sort of superpower rivalry between the US and China. And so I think Biden's been very clear that <clears throat> this is one area where cooperation needs to be preserved and needs to be enhanced. And, <clears throat> excuse me, there's just, I mean, China, China's the biggest emitter and it's also the, the, the coal consumer of the world and it's also the world's you know, powerhouse in terms of uh, the economy and manufacturing. So China will have to lead the transition um, and be at the, be at the heart of it. There's no, there's no possibility of China remaining on the sidelines. And I think the Chinese leadership is very well aware of that. Um, and the, you know, the Chinese leadership sees it as part of its ambition and its ma mandate for China to become you know, a superpower of, or continue to be, to grow as a superpower of the 21st century, that it is seen to shoulder this, you know, this, this res responsibility of, of protecting the planet. It isn't something that you just leave to other countries. So I think, I think they're aware of that, but they just have to convince themselves that it's a transition which can be done without um, causing political instability or, or economic um, damage. And I think we're, we're more or less there now, the, you know, that you've got zero carbon ambitions now for all of the major countries in the world. Um, fossil fuels will will end. That's clear. Um, you know the timelines and the sort of short to medium term um, transitions aren't aren't clear yet, but they will become so. So I think it just it, 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 you know no one was talking about zero carbon even three or four years ago, and now the whole world's basically on board with it. So politically things have moved a huge huge a huge distance, and so I think having that. Uh, being a bit older like I am in that process and it just really gives you a reality check for how far, how rapidly things have moved actually quite recently. Right, definitely. Things th things can definitely move very quickly. Um, there, there's there, there's definitely a momentum that we're seeing even with these COP processes, you know, every every time it rolls around, there seems to be more and more. I, that, that, that's, the, that's the point of it, that incremental progress kind of mechanism. Um, it's good to see it's working so that, that there is more kind of ambition ramping up over time. 
Uh, and what about on the U.S. side? Do you think that how would you rate uh, Joe Biden's first ten months or so in office? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's Biden has his political challenges domestically with you know getting legislation through Congress. Obviously, um, one of these big bills has got through. The other, hopefully, will do, um, and they. You know, when when stuff goes through Congress, it happens. When stuff is you know promised by a president in a speech, it doesn't happen. Um, and the Democrats understand that, and they've fortunately begun to find a way through their kind of in, you know internal warfare, <laughs> warfare to to getting to getting this stuff legislated, um, which is something the Republicans don't do. I mean, Republicans aren't interested in running the country; they're just kind of interested in trolling and spoiling. And so it's difficult, I think, for the Democratic Party to be like the only government governing party, and then and it's a shame. And I think the Republicans will have to hopefully, you know, you need you need to have more than one party being serious about running a country democratically for it to survive and thrive and prosper. So keep keep a watching brief on what happens for the Republicans more than anything else. But yeah, and that's obviously the background to everything Biden's trying to do. I think they're they're ambitions and their politics and, and, and all of that are all great, but what can they actually achieve given the sort of sclerosis and um, all, all of the problems of the American political system? Yeah, of course, it's, uh, it, it does seem like it's um, almost a little frustrating sometimes, you know, yeah, it's a, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of friction in getting things moving. Uh, I mean, kind of, you know, staying with this theme, do you think that, you know, democratic countries like the US with, you know, election cycles and, and, you know, short term, short term, short terms, and do you think that they are less equipped to deal with these more long term challenges that a country such as China might be with a more, you know, kind of unitary system? No, I, I don't think it really maps onto that. I mean, there's plenty of democratic countries with, with very high ambition. I mean, I'm, I mean, well, now the UK is uh, still fortunately relatively democratic and has had the first um, Climate Change Act passed in 2008, actually, and has uh, legally binding carbon budgets, which take us to net zero by 2050. Um, and looks like we might well be able to, to achieve that. And that's something which has been done with a cross-party consensus. I mean, the, the Conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrats, Greens, all of the parties agree that that's the track we need to be on. And there's no dispute about stupid stuff like the, whether climate change is real and things like that. There may be disputes about, you know, what, what technologies or what we build where and you know, how it's done and who pays for it and all of that kind of political stuff. But ultimately the direction of travel is something which everyone agrees on and that can happen in a democratic society. Um, which I think is, is is more desirable. That's the kind of political system that I'm uh, that I believe in, and I believe is 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 the best way to function. Um, so no, I, I don't I don't think you need a kind of green dictatorship <laughs> to to get this transition to happen. It's, you know that, and it's a good reminder actually that you've got to take people with you, that you do have to consider public opinion and and persuade people, as we've had to on COVID, that doing all of this is in their best interests and is. Is is a a shift which which they all need to play their part in. Um, this you know it, it's it's all of society that has to do this, not just a kind of political elite. If you do that, then you people get left behind, and you get conspiracy theories, and you know it, it basically fails. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I mean, yeah, there's there's obviously a, a lot of moving parts that that need to play you know their own role in all of this. Uh, but it, it does still seem that there's a lot of parts of the world, you know, a lot of global commons, global wildernesses, places that are more difficult to, you know, place regulations on, place restrictions on that um, we, it's, it's harder to hold people accountable for actions in, you know, oceans or Arctic areas and things like that. Um, do you think that there's a case to be made for a kind of a global uh, set of governance, uh, a global environmental protection agency that can protect these areas and these remaining global commons. Uh, maybe, but you know, we still live in an age where national sovereignty is paramount. Um, 
when you've got places which aren't subject to the sovereignty of different nations like Antarctica, for example, or, or even the, the great global ocean wildernesses, then yes, you, you clearly need multilateral um, governance agreements. And they've been relatively successful. I mean, we don't have Antarctica being drilled and mined on a large scale. I mean, there's, there's small things going on which aren't great, but um, protecting, uh, and, and fisheries is probably a better example, actually, where it, it's a global commons. Um, and, you know, I, I think we need to transition towards, well, away from eating seafood, actually. I'm kind of on board with that. We need to leave the oceans alone to recover. You know, we've just devastated the oceans all over the world with industrial fishing. Um, and, it, you know, there's a there's a marine biodiversity crisis and we shouldn't be eating that stuff, <laughs> right? It's not it's not complicated. Um, uh, you know, and I mean, I mean, on an industrial scale, I'm not talking about coastal fisheries by, you know, people local people but yeah you know it, you can't but you can't do this stuff top down it can't be imposed by the un we've got unep the united nations environment program there's different all of these things come under different multilateral agreements so the process processes are there you just have to have you have to have the political will i think to uh, to stand up to the to the business lobbies whether it's industrial fishing or seabed mining or whatever the next new thing is um where commercial exploitation isn't then paramount um, in the interests of, you know, the survival of the ecosystem. Um, and that's always gonna be a, a hard fight, but it's from a battle we're gonna have to keep on fighting. Of course, definitely. Yeah, I hope to see kind of more innovative, even models coming up to, to, to take all these externalities, all these other things into account in the future. Uh, a few, you know, wrap up questions. So humans, um, you know your 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 book doesn't always it, it it does point out that you know a lot of this a lot of these impacts in the world you know they're they're because of us there's because of what we, we've been doing uh are we you know are we a plague that will pass are we planet destroyers uh what should we think about ourselves within this context of what's happening we're the only species in the known universe that's made their planet shine and come alive visibly to outer space so we've, you know, if you believe in Gaia or Mother Earth, we've, we've provided a consciousness for a planet in a way that's possibly never happened before in the universe. So we're an incredible, special, beautiful thing, the human species. Um, and we, but we just have to not foul our own nest. We have to be able to protect the life support systems of the planet that ultimately nurture us. And we know how to do that. It's a messy, slow and complicated transition but i think we'll get there definitely are you are you hopeful are you optimistic that we can find a path to a to a more sustainable future yes completely i mean i'm a campaigner. there's no point in being a pessimistic campaigner um i advocate to for solutions which i think work and which i think are evidence-based and i believe in and i'm passionate and optimistic about them and i think we can do all these things i mean i'm a pragmatist as well i'm not advocating some kind of you know egalitarian utopia uh, all of this stuff is possible within you know uh, at least recognizable systems that we already use politically i mean i don't you don't have to completely change society and politics and the economics to to, to protect the planet's uh, systems definitely great so that's uh we're coming up on the hour uh so yeah, so you know our final warning. It's a it's a great read, uh, incredibly researched, very detailed. Uh, thank you so much for for updating it and for going through that uh, again to, to go through all those reports and all those academic studies once more. Uh, it's been it's a great service. We we, we really respect that. Uh, and thank you very much for your time tonight. It's it's been a pleasure. Nice to talk to you, and um, good luck with everything you're doing. Great. Thank you so much.